recent years, Africa has been a hotbed of innovation and entrepreneurship, attracting venture capitalists from around the globe. The Spider-Man quote that comes to mind is the one that says, with great power comes great responsibility. This also applies in the venture capital industry. For venture capitalists, we say, with great potential comes great risk. Amidst the promise of lucrative returns, they must grapple with challenges such as regulatory uncertainties, infrastructure limitations, and socioeconomic disparities. There are also rewards and opportunities that come in operating in Africa. So please join us as we examine the risks and reward of African venture capital. Hello and welcome to Tech Into the Future, where we talk about everything that's happening in tech and how it affects you. My name is Tommy Waladikomo. I'm the CEO of Tech Cabal, a publication that's been covering African tech for the last decade. And I am Ngozi Madu Kedozie. I look after Android Partnerships for West Africa at Google. Alongside Tamua, I will be your guide into the world of technology in Nigeria, Africa, and the world. So, so. venturing into African markets can be like navigating a maze of opportunities <laughs> and, and challenges. Indeed. It is triply so if you are trying to invest large sums of money into risky new business models. <laughs> exit with bigger. <laughs> and exit with more money than you came in. <laughs> and so today we're going to speak with somebody whose job it is to take lots and lots of foreign capital invested in African markets and escape with more of it than they came in. Indeed. It's going to be exciting. Stay with us on Tech Into the Future. Welcome back to Tech Into the Future on Arise News. Our guest this week is Alo Amame, the co-founder of First Check, a partner at TLCom Capital, and an advocate for gender and inclusion in Africa's venture capital space. Welcome to the show, Aloha. Hi, Tommy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we gave the guests a heads up that we're going to be using the acronym VC a lot today. Okay. But for the sake of those viewers who don't know what it is, what's a VC and what do they do? Okay. So VC literally means venture capital. Um, a venture capitalist is... Um, usually investing in innovation, investing in technology-based companies, not necessarily always software, but we tend to say, certainly in Africa, technology and technology-enabled. Um, and the idea is that you're really backing founders that have a couple of features. First of all, they're using technology and they're probably innovating around their business models. Secondly, they're addressing pretty large and pretty significant um, market opportunities. And thirdly, they want to build very big companies. And of course, with all of those dynamics, you know, there are many risk factors there. Mm. There's technology risk, there's scale, scaling risk, there is um, market risk, et cetera. So it tends to be um, a fairly risky proposition from an investment standpoint. Um, but that's, that's the principle. So you're literally investing in ventures. Um, the, you know, if you think about the, um, the beginning of, of VC as, as an asset class, it really was about backing people who had um, these really wild ideas um, around how they wanted to scale businesses. All right, so as a VC, tell us what lessons have you learned um, being a VC in Africa and what is your outlook for 2024? Sure. Um, I think I'll start with the I'll start with the second question. It's actually slightly easier. <laughs> um, outlook for 2024. I think um, 2024, in some ways, will have many of the features that we saw at the tail end of 2023 mm -hmm. in terms of venture capital, which was you saw um, or we saw that quite a lot of capital pulled out of our ecosystem, mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't necessarily on account of people who were 
Africa-based investors or Africa-focused investors investing on the continent, what was really happening, if you look at the numbers, is people who had come into investing in Africa over the last two or three years when you know global venture capital flows were significantly higher, starting to refocus on their own home markets, so mm. call it global funds. And because those pools of capital tend to be quite large, when they pull out of a frontier ecosystem, you know, your $5 billion, for example, in 2022 can become $3 billion of capital, um, for example. So I think we'll just see more of that generally constrained capital environment because that continues to be true. Um, the other thing I think we will see is um, <laughs> there's a bit of narrative and story around um, in, in, you know, if, if anyone who follows the venture asset class, there's a bit of story and narrative around company failures. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of us who are investing in VC, the notion of companies failing, you know, I described kind of the, the inherent risk in the asset class. The notion of companies potentially failing is one that um, we we accept as a feature of the asset class. Um, and we also kind of take this notion that says when um, it's not necessarily a bad thing at the ecosystem level, right? When capital is redirected into business models that perhaps are more profitable right. or propositions that have more potential to scale. But I think we'll see more of that. I think we'll see more of it because, of course, um, you know, as, as, as there's more time than some of the effects around, you know, more time and, and more constrained capital, some of the effects that we're seeing around business models, et cetera, they have time to play out. Companies run out of um, what we call runway, which is the cash that they have fundamentally to, to build their businesses with, and it is harder to raise capital. So I think we'll see a few more of those. Um, overall, though, I think it's also an environment in which um, for a young ecosystem, I think it's an environment that potentially actually can be quite um, can be quite instrumental in our development um, because it means that we start to think about, we're back to sort of thinking about the basics of company building and the fundamentals of those kinds of things. And you're in a more constrained environment, which means, you know, you'll reward, I suppose, the founders who are more capital efficient, who are always a little bit more disciplined, and those are all good things. Um, the other half of your question, which is much harder, is what have I learned as an Africa-focused investor? Um, I don't know if necessarily the things I have learned being somebody who invests in Africa are necessarily different from things I might have learned being someone who was investing in a different geography. I am hyper aware as an investor though that our ecosystem is, is pretty young. I always say it's really nascent. Um, and I think that the last year or so, the last couple of years for me in particular has reinforced this idea that when you have a young ecosystem and young in both directions, young in terms of the founders themselves, right. um, young in terms of what that means in terms of the companies they might have built, this notion of you know serial entrepreneurs. There are very few serial entrepreneurs exactly, in, in right. Africa, right? Yeah. Um, and on the other side of it, young in terms of the fund managers themselves, right? There are very few fund managers who can claim to have built raised an Africa-focused fund and seen that fund go through venture capital fund and seen that fund through, go through its entire life cycle. Um, so we're learning on all sides and both sides. And I think um, sometimes with the exuberance, one forgets that. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the big reminder for me in 2023 was that we, we kind of have to pace ourselves a little bit. We have to be pretty disciplined in terms of how we think about the ecosystem, how it grows, um, et cetera. So there's a whole series of questions that we're going to kind of come to a little bit later, but you've set us in that direction. Okay. So, I mean, on the due diligence front, I mean, there was a lot of concern about that last year. Is are these companies failing because yes, yeah. you know we haven't done enough due diligence? And um, you've already talked about sort of a little bit of the riskiness mm -hmm. inherent to the model. But how do you think about due diligence and its role sure. in, the, in the in the ecosystem? I think due diligence. Is, it's always important, and for many reasons. Number one is if you think about the way venture funds, um, the nature of venture funds, right? As a venture fund manager, you're aggregating capital, um, typically pension funds and high net worth individuals, et cetera. But that pension funds thing is, 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 is pretty important <laughs> because it's people's, it's right. people's it's retirement grandma's capital, it's grandma's retirement money. Um, and so it would be irresponsible to be deploying that capital without doing proper due diligence, right? So you know, if we kind of accept that, first of all, I think um, the other thing is also, you know, it's it's the, it's a critical part of, of the job and the role for that reason, but also because you're constantly evaluating um, different propositions, right? And you need some kind of basis around how you make the decisions. And the, the premise, I suppose, for those good decisions is often that I know a little bit more about one situation, or perhaps I know about the same about two situations, and on the back of that due diligence, I've made what I think is the better decision, right, because I have some information. Mm. And you can't get to that point if you haven't done any due diligence. 
Um, so as a practical thing, it's pretty important. As a sort of duty of care responsibility thing, it's pretty important. And I would think you say it's being done to the extent, there have been one or two deals where I must say, That's where as, an insider, <laughs> <laughs> as an insider, as an insider, it was like, <laughs> did they not ask <laughs> like, any where? questions? Okay. <laughs> I've had the same, I had the same reaction. I was like, mm, okay. Um, so I think, you know, back to this point I was making around the ecosystem as a whole and kind of a level of maturity. I think it's not just a feature of Africa, but I think when capital is more abundant, yes. um, a couple of things happen. Spending the money. Right. <laughs> and then also, um, you know, if you think about what was happening with us, there was more capital, but there was also more capital coming from investors who are not necessarily people who had historically or traditionally invested in, yeah. in Africa yes. and also had large, larger funds than the typical African fund size. So if for me, I'm saying to myself, this million dollar check into this company is a material portion of my fund. Um, a million dollars coming from a fund that is 10 times the size of mine and is not really looking at Africa as a core geography is a it. rounding error, right? right? And so I start to allocate resources a little bit differently, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I say to myself, what is the most I can lose here a million dollars? Whereas for those of us who are sitting on smaller pools of capital, that's pretty significant. So I think that first of all also just means that you approach diligence differently. The other thing that I think was happening was um, because there was more capital, there was more competition in general for deals, um, you know, because one more capital or two more different new sets of players coming into the market, you tend to have um, rounds being, we say more competitive, but I think at some point that ten, that competitive tension can actually be unhelpful um, because what you find is the time between, the time to close rounds is shortening um, because some people are able to write those checks to take a level of, a level of risk around kind of right. the, the exposure yeah. that others can't. Um, you then saw this dynamic whereby the time I would say that it would take to do a responsible level of due diligence was just shortened to a point where it was ridiculous. Um, and then so, you know, you, for better or for worse, you had calls that were made. Some of them were constrained by time. Of course, I'm sure there were others that was just a lack of adequate, you know, lack of appropriate duty of care. Um, I think it's a fair challenge, but I also think it's, it's important to reflect, to, to remember that some of that is also just this dynamic around um, the, how, how capital was moving around the ecosystem in the last couple of years. Okay, well, speaking about how capital was moving around um, and the impact in how people were then investing on the continent, do you think that there is a disconnect between the African um, startups mm -hmm. and the expectations of the VCs who obviously are intending to exit um, at some point? Do you think that the expectations are, I want to say, but realistic? On, on his part. Well, I, I guess your question is, is VC viable in Africa? I wasn't sure where we were going. <laughs> Without having to say that. Sorry. Um, yeah. I mean... When I get nervous. Yeah, I you just truth. tell the truth that you get a bit Jay-Z. Jay um, no, so, I mean, by, I guess by virtue of where I hang my hat, which is venture capital, I think I suppose my answer to the question wouldn't surprise you, which is that I do think VC is viable. Um... And part of, and the reasons why I think that are, are a couple of things. Number one is that we do have these large addressable opportunities in Africa. And there is a, I think sometimes oversimplified, but there is, you know, a very, fairly credible story or a very credible story around how technology provides opportunities to potentially just address, you know, access, consumption, mm. you know, um, distribution um, in Africa in ways that, um, is, you know, it's not currently happening today. So, for example, when you think about um, some of these e-commerce platforms, right, these B2B e-commerce platforms, and we've seen a couple of them shut down, yes, or a couple of them be constrained for capital. But the reality is the notion that using technology um, to, you know, uh, or reorganize distribution, for example, or give people better access to their ability to, to consume goods, um, using technology to... Uh, you know, distributes assets that are, to move assets around that are distributing those goods, right, yeah. um, is a notion that in principle makes sense. So the question is, how do you do that at a cost that is sustainable in the business? And yes. I think that's the exploration around the business model. But is that a large opportunity in Africa? Could it potentially be quite exciting? Yeah, in the same way as we've seen some of these platforms and some of these models emerge in, in China or in, 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 in Asia and Latin America. Um, so... You know, that's one reason, for example, why I, I think it's pretty viable. I, I also think that um, 
the nature of the challenge though will probably mean that maybe the average time to scale a company to a certain point yes. is a bit longer and maybe you know there's an argument around kind of the 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 fund length, which is a 10-year cycle, um, you know, to what extent is that fit for purpose in Africa, et cetera. Um, and the truth is that you've seen some of those things that are a bit standard. So this idea of a 10-year 10, 10 fund life, you've seen them shift even in the U.S., right, where you mm -hmm. have fund managers who are investing pretty early, saying, I can't do pre-seed investing or seed investing. In exactly, yeah. shifting towards permanent. So, so I think that's where the conversation probably should shift, rather, to, rather than this kind of... VC doesn't work in Africa. Um, I think there is opportunities to drive technology. There are big addressable market opportunities. There are entrepreneurs who want to build large companies. So why not? I promise that after this, we're going to get away from like making you the defender of <laughs> our VC. <laughs> so okay, um, I, I, and I, I mean, it really is a kind of last kind of sure. you know, um, it, it, does VC work? Is this? So I remember last year there was a big sort of sorry. Okay, I'm going to take that question again <laughs> completely. Um, okay, so I promise after this, I will get off of making you defend VC <laughs> as an asset class in its entirety. One of the areas of concern I've seen mm -hmm. is that we are in markets where most companies don't get a lot of funding, mm -hmm. even technology companies. And so I'm in forums with a different generation of fintech founders, and they're like, I started my business with 7,500 naira <laughs> that my <laughs> auntie... I that my, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, And so the, the question is, you know, you're deploying, and oh, again, you're deploying, you know, you have startups that have gone into YC, raised sure. $2 million, and then shut down within a year. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, isn't this just inefficient use of capital? That's interesting. You know, if you took that $2 million and you broke it into much smaller pieces, could you, I mean, build even technology businesses mm -hmm. just with much less capital going sure. out with each check. So I have <laughs> some sympathy for that, but I will say that I think those are actually two, two separate things that we're conflating. Okay. Um, the first point uh, is one of capital efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. this notion of wasteful kind of capital and, and burn rates yeah. that don't have to be that high and all of that, right? So I built my own 7,500. In principle, um, the cost of starting a technology company and running it over time has come down, right? right. Um, so, and of course, you know, you're, you're, you're scaling, trying to scale a business that inherently, the business model that inherently, I suppose, has you know, compared to an SME, for example, driven somewhat by the market opportunity, also driven by kind of the features of what you're doing, has an inherently higher capital requirement. So if you have a fair, a large amount of capital, it's almost irresponsible not to manage it in an efficient way. And that is metrics, KPIs, you know, working in this, you know, always kind of viewing yourself as capital constrained and looking to stretch your, your runway. And I think there's that point. So I think it's a fair challenge when you say that, um, you know, there should be a lot of capital discipline. But I think that should always be true even in markets, even in, in cycles where we have more abundance of capital versus less. And I think, again, back to my point around maturity, right, of an ecosystem on both sides. Um, the one that I have less sympathy for, and I get this challenge a lot as a venture capitalist, <laughs> is this notion that capital that is venture should be reallocated to other kinds of companies or other businesses. Um, I... I think the problem that we actually need to solve is a more um, systemic one, which is that there are no alternative, there are very few alternative paths right. to capital for entrepreneurs in general. Forget technology entrepreneurs, right? Um, whether it is debt, there's a constraint there. Whether it is SME funding, there's a constraint there. And those we really need to address. Um, because if you think about it in other parts of the world, vent well, the US, the most mature market. Venture capital is a large amount of capital, but it's not the most significant amount of capital that funds entrepreneurship. Um, in Africa, it's probably also true that it's not the most significant, but it is a pretty significant it's, it's chunk. A, it's, and a it's a much larger chunk. It's a, yes, yeah, it's a much larger proportion. And that's because the, the rest of kind of the ecosystem around entrepreneurship you know, has its own deficits and its lacks. So I think the way that venture, I think venture certainly has to be responsible about the way venture founders building venture back companies and investors that are supporting their companies. Certainly, you have the privilege of having a fair amount of capital directed towards your asset class. 
I think it makes sense that you should be responsible about how that capital is allocated. But I don't think it means that the asset class, the capital that venture gets to go, I think we need to fix that problem as a separate issue. So I actually think of that as two separate things. You know, I wonder if now in the winter, as we call it, yeah. um, there will be a little more discipline. Um, I hope just so. as a, just because that's the what, that's the trend of the industry, right? Where 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 you, where there is no immediate expectation that another check is coming, you're then going to have to be a little more disciplined I about how so. you use the one the, 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 the capital right. you have. <laughs> I can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what what's your take on sort of alternative capital coming into the market? So you have some of the you know. I mean, uh, some of the big international funders who ordinarily wouldn't have been in technology starting to talk about putting some money into that space. Do you see capital from other sources coming into the VC space on the continent to fill that, that pullback from six billion to two, three billion that we've seen in the last 12 um, months or so? I think yes, but certainly not um, so far in a sort of a, a systematic, in, in, a, in a significantly scaled way relative to your point, the, the amount of capital that has pulled out. But you see, we are seeing regional flows of capital into Africa that historically were not necessarily there. So for example, you know, there's quite been quite a bit of investment into um, Africa-based venture capital funds from Japan. Um, you see strategic capital coming in, also sometimes from 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 Japan, but also you know um, other parts of Asia, etc., where you have large corporates looking to invest, you know, either through vent, um, corporate venture capital, which is you know their, their venture capital arms that is meant to support their own innovation, or really ultimately on balance sheet for them saying, I'm not going to own these assets, but I will make some investments. I won't 100% own them, but I will make some investments in these assets as a potential play into the future to secure, for example, a route to market into Africa. You see that kind of thing. I think um, one challenge that one challenge that the ecosystem as a whole has, um, at least the, the, the fund side of it, is that we don't yet see enough capital, um, private capital from high net worth individuals, et cetera, coming into the asset mm -hmm. class. Um, I think we need to There's see been more a bit of that. Of movement in that. A little bit of movement. People tend to sort of talk about the angel capital. Um, yes, um, but I actually am referring more to capital coming into venture capital funds. Fund. Okay. So high net worth families, right. family offices, that kind of thing. You don't really see too much of that in a systematic way. And I think, do think we need to see more of it. Um, if you look at, again, many institutional funds, maybe most institutional funds investing in Africa, a significant portion of their capital actually comes from European DFIs, for yes, example. Indeed, yeah. And that's very helpful to getting the ecosystem started. But you know, once we mature, we need to start replacing some of that capital as the funds scale with um, commercial capital, high net worth individuals, that kind of thing. Um, and I don't think we're seeing enough of that yet. On that note, we'll pause and take a break. Stay tuned. Tech into the future. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Tech Into the Future. We're still here with Eloa Omame. Eloa. Yes, so Eloa is um, also co-founder of First Check Africa, which is um, a company um, that plays quite a pivotal role in the Africa tech space. Tell us, what are your plans for supporting the female-led startups this year? Sure. Um, so First Check Africa invests in technology ventures um, led by, we say female led, so for us that means um, at least one of the founders or co-founders, if, there, if there's a, if there are a group of them or if there's more than one, um, is a woman. Mm. Um, and uh, we tend to invest pre-seed, which means we tend to invest very early. So usually the point at which we're investing is typically pre-revenue. Um, maybe an MVP or a product, the first version of the product has been built, perhaps it has not. Um, but it's taking very, very early stage risk. Mm. Um, part of the reason that we do that, I guess, is, um, is, is twofold. One is that we think it's an opportunity that is largely unaddressed within the ecosystem. And when I say opportunity, I mean an, an, an opportunity um, because women tend to um, actually be pretty excellent operators, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then when it comes to deploying capital towards female-led businesses, you know, stories that touch, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so um, for us, we view that as an opportunity. And we think to ourselves, people are missing a trick here. Yeah. Um, we can do this. We can support women to, to scale their, their, their venture, their technology ventures. And I guess um, 
the second reason or the second way that we think about our thesis is really this notion around, you know, um, I call it the 2% ceiling, which is really this idea that if you look at the numbers, interestingly, across any ecosystem, whether it's Africa, Asia, the US, mm -hmm. you typically find that the share of venture capital that goes to female-led, exclusively female-led ventures um, is roughly about 2%. Wow. Um, and so, you know, in Africa, which is $3 billion, 2% of that is a very small number, it's 30 million. Um, in the US, it's multiples, but it's usually about that, so that 2%. And so um, there is kind of a notion around um, addressing the market opportunity, but also kind of supporting an underrepresented under segment of, of the founder base. Fantastic. So you joined Tealcom, which is much larger. Much larger. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have managed over $300 million. Um, also to boost their portfolio and to support female startups sure. as part of. Um, so what's deploying capital from that larger fund? What, have there been differences? What's sure. that journey been like? Well, so I guess the first thing to say is that First Check Africa is very lucky in that TLCOM is a provider of capital into First Check Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and that was sort of one of the, um, I guess, features around sort of uh, my, my joining the firm. Um, and so if you think about it, TLCOM invests at uh, seed and series A. So typically comes in after somebody has done the pre-seed investing. TLCOM has a commitment to female founders. I think um, TLCOM runs the largest, for the last five years, the largest um, conference that convenes female-led founders of technology ventures on the continent. Um, and, but you know that's sort of seed and A focus. So the partnership with First Check Africa um, also supports pipeline at, at TLCOM. But you're right that because the stages of the companies are pretty different and the pools of capital are pretty different and the downside risk on a check at First Check Africa looks very different to the downside risk at TLCOM, there is a little bit of context switching that often needs to happen. Um, but we think that the, the, two, the two platforms are complementary um, in, 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 to the extent that the stages, you know, the stage focuses are different, um, et cetera. Mm, so that's interesting. With an with an average investment of about six million per startup, um, why is TLCOM investing big or betting big um, on the continent? Oh, um, so TLCOM is very very bullish on on the African continent for some of the reasons that I that I that I alluded to earlier. So you know, large market opportunities. People tend to point to the population, um, but also large pools of consumption around um, different different um, sectors um, and opportunities to upscale that by you know um, or to grow those to expand those market opportunities. For, for example, by driving access. Mm -hmm. So you know, we talk about healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our healthcare today is kind of you know. Um, paid for out of pocket. Imagine how much more delta you could create in the size of the market opportunity if you're able to provide credit and insurance, et cetera, to meet healthcare, education, and this is another example, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's something around, can you build and design business models that do things like distribute a bit better, get, you know, create opportunities for better access and expand what is already large pools of, large um, consumption patterns and make them bigger. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, I think, a fundamental kind of thesis around technology and its ability to support those kinds of things and do it. Um, historically, Telecom started as a European fund, um, European-focused firm. Um, about 20 years ago, not a lot of people know that the, f the firm is about 20 years old, but 10 years ago, roughly, TLCOM raised its first, um, or started raising its first Africa-focused fund. And the reason for that was because they had seen quite a lot of success um, within the European-focused um, portfolio um, around um, the the African performance, I suppose, of, you know, when you had companies that were growing in Africa and they had subsidiaries in Africa, there were a lot of sort of exits and, and what have you within that segment of the portfolio. And so, you know, it was, uh, it created kind of, I suppose, the, the, the platform for the thinking around raising an Africa-focused fund. Fantastic. And so in executing that mission, how does TLCOM think about risk in Africa and the potential size of the returns? Um, I think... We are comfortable that venture capital risk, venture capital is inherently a risky asset class. Um, for all of the reasons that I've alluded to, there's technology risk, you know, there's execution risk, et cetera. Um, macro there's macro, there's all of those things. Um, in terms of how we think about returns, I think, I suppose, the, the trite answer to that question is that the return sort of needs to compensate for the risk. Um, the reality is that at some point, and we're, we're iterating around this, right? But at some point you say to yourself, um, if I make a set of assumptions around what the growth opportunity looks like here, and I make a set of assumptions around where assets are priced, how much capital I'm investing, therefore how much of these businesses I get to own, 
at some point my funds need to perform in a way that allows me to raise the next fund. So that all of that math um, has implications for how we think about the kinds of companies that we go into. So for example, sectors, how we think about the stage of businesses that we go into. So for example, my ability to 3X a return on a series B or series C investment looks very different from my ability to do that if I were investing a little bit earlier. But of course, the risk looks a little bit different. So I think we, we, we take that general kind of framework into designing the fund and, and sort of the portfolio construction. And we've ended up with a world in which we say, um, you know, we're a seed and series A investor. Six million dollars, I think, out of the first fund. Typically now, it's a slightly smaller check size initially. So it's more kind of like two to four. But, um, you know, as companies perform over time, the best performing companies within TLCOM's portfolio actually have access to significantly more capital than that six million dollars. Um, just by virtue of larger funds, l larger capital to invest, but also a strategy around um, with our follow on capital, following actually the performance, you know, companies that perform well um, and not necessarily every single company in the portfolio from a reverse stand, from a reserve standpoint. Mm. So let's switch gears a little bit, uh, switch focus a little bit and uh, talk about the public policy. Well, well, yes, public policy and your perspective as to what types of policies you think would be um, interesting or helpful for the tech sector. Sure. Um, so I think uh, one area that I think is really interesting and maybe concerning is the word I want more, um, <laughs> is that there's something, you know, we're seeing this trend and this pattern around, call it a brain drain, mm. um, where fundamentally you're seeing, you know, some really exceptional talent, not necessarily exit technology, mm. but certainly kind of geographically exit Nigeria, yes. exit Africa. Um, and that has a few implications, mm -hmm. um, including, of course, the available pool of, pool of capital on the continent. Also, the cost of that cap, the cost of that talent, right? Or the available yeah. pool of talent on the continent, but the cost of that talent as well. Because the second, for example, your living costs go from Naira-based in Lagos to Sterling-based in London. Right. Then you know certain propositions are more attractive and others are less attractive. So I think what it, what that means, for example, is that that kind of talent is a little bit more expensive mm -hmm. for founders that are trying to build propositions, you know, Naira generating propositions in, in, in Nigeria, in Africa, for example. Um, so I really think that from a policy standpoint, there is something, something to think about very carefully um, in terms of what policy can do to help to support or sort of counter that effect somewhat. Um, the analogy is, for example, the UK, which is doing its damnedest to make sure that it attracts talent yes, from places yes, like yes. Africa. So what is our own sort of competitive response? Because this talent is as valuable, perhaps even more valuable for us than it is for them. Um, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy thing to solve for, but it's a big one, I think. It's not, especially with the devaluating of the Naira. It's very difficult to then tell you know, a young person that has the ability to make more mm -hmm. um, money outside to stay in country. And so we do have our work cut out for us from a policy okay. standpoint. I think what I really like there is your point around the UK making a deliberate policy mm -hmm. decision mm -hmm. and a deliberate sort of government effort to attract target talents to its market. Sure. And if you think in the last government, when we talked about this brain drain, there are people that are in government saying, let them go. Let them go. <laughs> we'll train more. I, I, and I, I, I hammer that point because we... When you think about setting an agenda for government, when you think about what a government should be doing, your point is you need a deliberate policy plank sure. that is around retaining your talent. Mm -hmm. So sure. if there's anyone in the government listening to this, <laughs> Eloho thinks. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no I, a little bit seriously, I, have, I cannot say that I've heard in public discourse a serious government response or a deliberate sort of, you know, the Minister of the Interior or the President or anybody saying, as a policy, here's how we're going to keep the talents that we train or here's sure, how we're going to yeah. retain people. And we absolutely need that. And, if I, we're, and the yeah. truth is there are a bunch of instruments, right? We currently use it to um, protect other sectors of, of the economy, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, um, there are call them FX subsidies, right, fundamentally, right. that sort of go into other sectors. And we consider them critical sectors, and we want to sort of defend our ability to, to compete within those sectors. Mm 
um, we support um, education, cost of education, and you know medical uh, cost of medical expenses, for example, with FX subsidies. Because you know there are certain categories of things that we will support the importation of, but not others because we view some things as more competitive than others. I wonder if there's not something around talent and people that says this particular profile of talent. Um, you know, to your point around you know devaluation, etc. This right. particular um, class of talent, I will protect its ability to earn right. um, by making sure that there's some form of a subsidy that goes into you know your ability to pay them, um, and maybe it's linked also to to FX in that way. There's you know something around. Um, even you know people tend to sort of think about infrastructure and access to um, to to internet etc. And that's all valuable, but there's also something around um, maybe tax advantages and tax benefits. Mm -hmm. Right? We think right. about it in other spaces as well. Right. Maybe tech, the technology space, maybe technology talent should have um, preferential tax rates. Right? To the extent that they're helping us build these companies of the future. Um, but I think it really needs. Um, some degree of some acceptance that this is strategic. Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty strategic because it's really about building scale companies. Because ultimately, we want to ring fence around the quality of life for, for, for this category of people. It's not a coincidence that people are jacked by into Canada. Canada is actually very intentional about yeah. attracting a certain class of people to their country. I think, again, sort of the ultimate goal here is, like you said, you're trying to build these companies that are at scale, which means they can hire lots of people. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about FX, for instance, they can earn FX, um, depending on what the businesses are and what, what it is they serve. What are your thoughts about sort of the initiatives in the current government from a technology perspective? So the ministerial roadmap, uh, three MTTs, which is the training three million technical talents. Do you have any thoughts, any engagement around those? No, I, I think it's all, I, I, I like it. I think it's all, I think it's all good stuff. Um, so, you know, not to take away from any of that. I think it's a complex, I think, you know, I think the, the, the Minister of Technology has a, a difficult job, a complex job, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty grateful that he is somebody who has come out of the ecosystem and understands it and understands kind of, you know, what his challenges are and what the opportunities are. Um, I just wonder if this question of talent cannot also be one line um, around kind of how we think about the future. I think it is, it's, except it's been from a talent training and talent yes, development and that's perspective how we rather than a retention, retention of... of and that's not, I guess my point is there's something potentially around a competitive response in a world in which there is a competitive exactly. effort yes. to pull talent out of, out of Africa. So we know you're no weather woman, you're a VC, um, but if you could forecast the outlook for the tech ecosystem for 2024 in one word, what would that word be? I'll use two words. I'll say still wintry. <laughs> <laughs> I think for us, we'll call it Hamatan. Okay. It's been cold. Um, it's going to stay cold. It's going to stay a little bit cold. Thank you very much for joining us, Aloha. It's been fascinating to have you today, and we look forward to having you again. Thank you, guys. Thank uh, you so much. Stay with us. You're still watching Tech Into the Future on Arise News. Welcome back to Second to the Future, where we just had an engaging interview with Eloho Anome. Tell me, what are your thoughts? Um, I thought it was really interesting that female founders get 2% everywhere. Ridiculous. In and Africa, ridiculous. in Asia, in the US, it doesn't matter what market it is. I wonder what it is about the gender that just says, no, yeah, we don't trust you. 2% <laughs> is what you get. Yeah. I think it's interesting, the point that she made about women being sort of really strong operators, because yes. I found that in running a business, you want dependable, you want solid, you yeah. want, like, you, you get women on your team. Um, but, I'd say yes. Yeah. But <laughs> it's been my experience. I mean, 75% of my exec team is women. Um, so yeah, I found that they are really, really good operators, but it appears there's a lot more work to do to actually get capital yeah. into their hands. And that's why I like the idea of First Check, and I think what Telecom is doing is because, listen, you can't change something unless you have intention to do so, right? Yeah. Because a lot of times, to be fair, and I was kidding earlier on, but the truth is that there's a lot of times when it's bias. It's unconscious bias. You're not doing it intentionally. Um, and so the only way to, to, to fix in, uh, unconscious bias is intentional, like intentionality. Yeah. 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 Um, I thought the talent retention conversation was really interesting as well. Um, yes. And again, I think, yeah, around some of the specific points that she made in terms of what, you, what levers you could move mm -hmm. to improve talent re retention. But I thought what was most important is the idea that, look, you've got to have 
a government that's deliberate yes. about retaining talents because mm -hmm. it takes us so much to educate people in medicine, you know, in engineering, and we have subsidies for training people in these mm -hmm. skills. And then you have these technology people, uh, technology founders come in here, they build companies, you have developers that are very expensive to train, and then you let them all sail out of the country yep. into Canada or the UK or whatever it is. I mean, I know how many technician applications that mm -hmm. I've seen sort of from people who've worked with or around me. And as a country, we've got to be really serious about, actually, everyone talks about talent, people are our biggest asset. And then we're letting our best trained and best educated and most capable talent run away. It doesn't make any sense. So what we should do is treat our, we treat our talent like we treat crude. Yeah. Right. Um, because that is the resource we have. And based on the numbers, um, that's the resource we're going to have going into the future. I don't, I'm not, we may not have crude for as long as we think we may have it's it. Right. Well, but the we're not doing but, well. <laughs> we're not doing is. well. Yeah. But, you know, the population and the young population is going to be what it is. Right. And it's going to continue to be what it is into the future. And so if we ring fenced around that, and this actually reminds me of the interview with, I think, a few weeks ago now with Bayo Aladiloba that was talking about some kind of, uh, I know he talked about like an oasis, right? But really it's one thing to train people and then get them to a certain earning capacity. Then you can, when, once you've done that, you must understand that they want better for themselves. And if they so can't find that better, exactly. Yeah. If you can't find that better here, then they're going to find it elsewhere. And so it's how do we create, um, how do we ring fence around them and give them a quality of life that they would want to have um, Offshore. And it keeps them in here. And it yeah. keeps them here. Yeah. I think the last point is that it's still winter. So mm -hmm. it's still going to be, and we've heard this from a few people, it's still a really, really tough funding environment. Mm -hmm. This year is still going to be really challenging for, for tech startups. And so I think get your, get your, get your winter coats out. But well, here's the thing, on. that might not be a terrible thing, right? Because as they say, it's during the winter that a lot of the big innovation happens, right? So people will start thinking a little more creatively. People will be better disciplined about how they spend their capital. People would be um, more efficient as to how they use the resources they currently have. And we might actually see some M&As that we should be seeing, right? Um, so yes, it's winter. We have our winter coats out, but you know, that's not a bad thing. I actually like winter fashion. So I guess that's what we're doing. <laughs> Keep your winter fashions on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us again for another episode of Tech Into the Future. We will be back next week to take you deeper into the world of tech in Nigeria, in Africa, and globally. Stay with us on Arise News.